speaking to Kyle. Now, Kyle was speaking this morning about uh, the covenant and about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the, the latter and, and such. Well, I wanted to talk a little bit today about Abraham. And uh, back in the Old Testament, there was there was um, a couple of different ways you could you could see God and be connected to God. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, obviously, in the beginning with Adam, um, he was in the Garden of Eden and his connection was there. The God would come down in the cool of the evening and they would commune and they would have conversation. And then uh, then uh, then they blew it, both Adam and Eve, you know, they they blew it. And then from there, it was Noah. Noah was a righteous man. And God saw that Noah was a righteous man and that mankind was continually following that which was evil in their hearts. But Noah stood out. And so Noah came down and talked to Noah and said, hey, I've got this plan. I'm going to build a boat. I want you to build a boat and et cetera. And so Noah was able to commune with God at that level. Afterwards, there was uh, Abraham. Abraham came on the scene. And uh, I wanted to take a look a little bit about Abraham and his relationship with God and how he found favor or why he found favor in the sight of God and what was the difference. And as Kyle was talking about the Abrahamic covenant, that's, that's going to be something that's interesting for us because why would God choose him out of, out of everybody in the world? But obviously God knows the hearts and the mind of mankind. And he knows that when he gives something to people, the obedience is important. And to obey God is where we find the blessing. And so open your Bibles, if you would, to James chapter 2. Uh, James chapter 2, we're going to start there. And again, I wanted to, uh, James in chapter 2, and we will start in verse uh, 23. James 2, 23. Again, we're going to look at Abraham a little bit here, and this is uh, James in the book of James, and it's a scripture about Abraham, and it says in verse 23, and the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Not an amazing title, right, to be called the a friend of of the creator of all things, a friend of the creator of the universe and the universes, right? We don't know how many universes are out there and the stars and the magnitude of it, but God we know created. And we know that Abraham, as it says here, was called the friend of God because of his righteousness. Well, let's look a little bit into Abraham's uh, uh, life. And so we're going to do a little bit of uh, let's go back to uh, Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. We're going to be in Genesis for a little bit, kind of going through a few different. Um, uh, chapter 12, verse 1. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now, this is the time where God comes up to Abraham and says, hey, I want to have a relationship with you. I want to, I want to work a great work with you. And so I got a plan. I want you to follow this plan. In chapter 12 of Genesis and verse 1, it says, now the Lord had said unto Abram, and this was his name before Abraham, his, his name was changed later, but this is uh, early in his piece. He says, now he said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curses thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And so as Kyle was saying earlier about the Abrahamic covenant, there's a lot that goes into it. But this is basically the beginning of the promise. And God says, look, this is what I'm going to do for you. I am going to step out and choose you and give you and promise you all of these things. But you must follow me. You must obey what I ask you to do. I need you to leave your, your, your town, your city, your town, your country, your land. I need you to leave your family and your friends. Pack your stuff up and come on, let's go. Because I've got a special place that I'm going to place you in. And in verse 4. So Abraham departed. I mean, isn't that amazing? Right? If somebody were to come to us today or we were to be standing here and you hear this voice out of, 
you know, heaven. Uh, okay, you guys in Seattle, I want you all to sell everything you have, pack up, and I want you to move to Texas. <laughs> I'm going to bless you. You're going to be great. You're going to be a huge fellowship. Many people are going to be saved. And so pack up, let's go. And we would be like, did you hear that? Did you, what did you, right? But Abram was like, okay, God, if that's, obviously he had a relationship or God had a relationship with him and was able to connect so that Abraham said, okay, I will do that. And in verse four, so Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him and Lot went with him. And Abraham was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. Not only that, you know, at this age, it's not like he's 20, you know, or 25, a young age and hasn't really got roots planted yet. I mean, this guy's been here for a while. He's got roots at 75 years old. Come on, buddy, it's time to travel. Okay, in verse seven, let's go down to verse seven. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. And so the cool thing about God is that when, when God gives a promise and God talks to his people, he backs it up and he confirms it. And he knows that we're a weak group of people, right? We're all a bunch of misfits. We're all a bunch of rat bags, right? We're, we're all just human. And he takes that into consideration. And he says, no problem. I will confirm my word with you. I will encourage you all along the way. I will be there for you. I will be that set of footprints in the sand. You guys might have seen, you know, the footprints in the sand, that whole thing. And you see two footprints and then one set of footprints. Well, it's God carrying us. And God says, I will be there for you once I am committed to you. And then for us in this day and age, once we get filled with God's Holy Spirit, God says, that's it, man, you're stuck with me. I'm not ever leaving you. If you wanna leave, I mean, you can go ahead, but I'm, I'm still with you because I'm not leaving you, which is an amazing thing. God's got such patience and compassion and mercy for us. And so he's giving Abram again the encouragement. Keep going, buddy, see all this land? This is all yours. This is what I've promised you. I don't know, maybe he looked out and saw the desert and says, is that it, really? I mean, can't we get like some beach property or something? Anyways, let's go down to verse 11. And it came to pass when he was come near to enter into Egypt that he said, unto, this is Abram, he said unto Sarai, his wife, behold, now I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore, it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee that they shall say, this is wife and they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. So, so say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. So Ab Abram, he's got faith in God. I mean, he's packed up his stuff. He's walking along this trail, but he's still got that little voice in the back of his, that little doubt, right? And so he says, look, look, honey, I know we've been married 75 years old. We've been together for a long time and you're still, uh, I mean, you're still pretty good looking. I'm all wrinkly and old. You know, they're going to say that this guy, he's going to get rid of me and take you. So just say you're my sister. Okay. Down in verse 17. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai's, uh, Sarai Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this that thou hast done unto me? Why did thou not tell me she was your wife? Why saidest thou she is my sister? So I might have taken her to me to wife. Now therefore behold thy wife, take her and go thy way. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. So in one sense, Abram got his wish that he wasn't killed, but now they're sort of banished from the land in a sense, but it was a little bit of deception there, right? Abram's going, hey, let's, let's make sure I'm going to be okay. Down in chapter 13, let's go to verse 15. Verse 15. And the Lord is saying here again to Abram, he says in verse 15, for all the land which thou seest to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And so again, as they're walking along and they're going and they're going through this land and Abram's got his stuff and his carts and his servants and, 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 and the people and the sheep, God is saying, look, keep going, man. You're doing right. You're doing good. Keep going. I'm going to give you all this. My promise 
is still there. <clears throat> Down in chapter 14, in verse 1. And it came to pass in the days of Ephrael, a king of Shinar, Ariot, king of Elasser, Shaladolorim, king of Elam, all these name, goofy named kings. Um, in verse 2, that these made war with Bara, the king of Sodom, and with Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, Shinab, and these kings. And in verse 3, these were all joined together in the vale of Sidon, which is by the Salt Sea. All these joined together. Oh, yeah, in verse 4, 12 years they served this guy, and 13th year they rebelled. And so there's a war going on. And uh, Abraham, uh, Abram wasn't caught in the middle of it, but his, his nephew Lot was caught. And uh, ended up happening that they took Lot captive, <clears throat> these kings. And down in verse 14, and in verse 14, it says, And when Abram heard that his brother or his nephew was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. And he divided himself against them. He and his servants by night and smote them and pursued them unto Hobah, which is in the left hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. So these big, these four kings of these four nations went and made war with these other four kings of these other nations. And Lot was sort of caught in the middle and they took them away. And Abram said, you don't do that to my family. That's it. I'm going to take my 318 men and I'm going to show you who's boss. Right. And so Abram went and conquered and got back all the goods again. I mean, that's an amazing testimony and miracle there. And in verse chapter 15 and verse 1, after these things, the, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. <clears throat> Excuse me. And Abram said, Lord God, what will thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And so at this point, obviously, uh, um, Abram is saying, I'm getting old. You know, I know you're with me, God. You've made these great promises. You've helped me to, to, to conquer this, these unheard of odds in battle. And we took victory over these kings. I know you're with me and I'm trying to be obedient and I'm following you. But what's going to be my legacy, right? Who is going to be the heir of all my stuff? Here I am getting old. <clears throat> Excuse me, in a verse four. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thy own bowels shall be thy heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it unto him for righteousness. That's Abram believed in the Lord. And God counted it unto him for righteousness. So even though Abram could see that, how is this going to happen? I don't understand. I know you're with me. I know you're working these miracles, but I don't understand how my seed is going to inherit all of this since I don't even have any children yet. But he believed God, he trusted in God. And we know that the word believe in the New Testament is very important. It's a verb. It's an action word. Believe doesn't mean to just look at something and say, oh yeah, okay, I believe that, sure. Believe in the, the scriptures that we look at, like in Mark chapter 16, he that believes and is get, gets baptized. Believe is an action word. It means to trust in, to rely on, to obey, to do something. And Abraham was doing something. He was being obedient and he was following God. And so that word believe, it says he believed, Abram believed God and it was counted unto him as righteousness. Abram was obedient, he was taking action and that was the righteousness. Uh, where are we at here? 15, uh, let's go to 17, chapter 17, verse one. 
in verse 1 of chapter 17, and Abraham was 90 years old and nine. He's 99 years old, 24 years he've been, he's been following what God has said. Come on out, all this land I'm going to give you, your children, your seed are going to be as the sand of the sea, as the stars in heaven. Here he is 99 years old and doesn't have any heirs yet, but still believing, 24, talking about the patience of Abraham. That's amazing. Of Abram. In verse, uh, um, yeah, 99, let's continue on. He's 99 years old. The Lord appeared unto Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram. But thy name shall be called Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee, and I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make thee nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And so again, God is confirming his word with signs following. He's confirming to Abram these 24 years. And now at this point, Abram's, Abram's probably going, come on, man, I'm 99 years old. You're going to give me a child? I mean... I, you know, come on, I'm losing my energy. You're going to give me energy too? Obviously, he had the faith and he had the confidence that God was going to take care of all that. Down in verse 20, Genesis chapter 20. Sorry, chapter 20. Abraham uh, is talking here, Genesis chapter 20 and verse 1. They're, they're cruising along again. And Abram, uh, Abraham, in verse 20, uh, chapter 20, verse 1, Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south of the country and dwelt in Kadesh and Shur, and sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. God's probably going, come on, buddy. Right? Again? <laughs> So Abraham, Abraham is in his own strength still sometimes, and still he's kind of fearful, and he's dealing with these emotions. In verse 3, But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said unto him, Behold, thou art but a dead man, for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? She is not unto me, she is my sister." And she even said herself, he is my brother in the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands. Have I done this? And God said unto him in a dream, yea, I know. It's my, it's my servant Abraham again. He hasn't quite gotten over it, right? He's, yea, I know, he says in verse 6, that thou didst this in the integrity of thine heart. For I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered thee I not to touch her. And so God is understanding, right? And he's talking to Abimelech and he says, okay, I know. And obviously Abimelech had some sort of a relationship with God or wanted to know God or was trying to, in his own strength, do the best he could. And so God says, look, you're okay, man. I got you. You're covered. Down in verse 9. And in verse 9, then Abimelech called Abraham and said unto him, what hast thou done unto us and what have I offended thee that thou hast brought on me and unto my kingdom a great sin? Thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done. And Abimelech said unto Abram, What sawest thou that thou hast done this thing? And Abram said, Because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. And in verse 12, And yet indeed she is my sister. This is Abraham speaking. She is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. So obviously back in, in the, the old days, they did things a little bit different. And so Abraham was sort of telling the truth, but not telling the whole truth, right? He was just kind of spinning it his direction, saying, well, I'm not really lying, but I'm not really telling the truth. And so we see Abraham was conflicted. Even though God was working these great miracles, Abraham was conflicted, but he still wanted to do the right thing. And he was still being obedient to God's leading. And so the amazing thing is, Abraham was trying, but his flesh was weak. He didn't have the Holy Spirit like we have. 
And I mean, if his flesh was weak, obviously we know that our flesh is weak as well. And we make, we make decisions that afterwards we go, oh man, why did I do that? Right. And God's up there going, Bobby, 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 why are you, you know, come on, just trust me. I got this. Okay, Lord, let's, let's, let's start over. Let's get back on track and do this again. I mean, we all have those little pebbles in the road, those potholes sometimes. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. So that's a bit of the story of Abram, uh, Abraham. Uh, we know that he had a son, Isaac, and uh, um, uh, he also had a son, Ishmael, because in his own strength. But he had a son, Isaac, that was the son of promise. And Isaac grew up following God's word. Isaac had a couple of sons, um, Jacob and Esau. Jacob got the blessings, the, the, the promises, the Abrahamic covenant passed down, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, etc. And so we know that through their stumblings and troubles, they were able to get through it and uh, continue to follow on. One verse here in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, it says, By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed and he went out not knowing where he went and so we see again just putting uh putting a putting the strength of obedience that abraham felt he didn't know where he was going to go he was happy and settled maybe he had his house or his tent paid off right and camels and, and stuff he was comfortable and the Lord says, no, I'm going to work a great miracle with you. So come on, pack up, let's go, let's move. And he did willingly. And that was part of the obedience and the righteousness. Let's go back to James chapter 2. We'll read a little bit more of that verse. James chapter 2, we'll start in verse 20. A couple more scriptures here. James chapter 2 in verse 20. <clears throat> In verse 20, it says, But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? This is a whole other story, and we could go into a lot of different stories about Abraham, and at some point we will. But this is just one of the stories that he talked about, offering his son Isaac on the altar, the son of promise. And it says... Uh, uh, was not Abraham, in verse 21, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar, seeing thou how faith wrought with works, and by works was faith made perfect. And so God had said that he was going to give Abraham a son and an heir, and he gave him Isaac. And once Isaac was born and was raised, he was in his early or mid-teens, 16, 17, 18 or so. And God said to Abraham, take your son and offer him up on the mount. Sacrifice him to me. Now, Abraham had faith. And that faith was justified by his works. Because God said to him, take your son and offer him up. He said, okay. He got his son. He got the, the mules or the donkeys. He got the wood. He got the fire. He got the knife. He got some provisions, his servants, and they started heading up toward the place to offer his son. That is the works that Abraham was doing by following and by being obedient. That's believe. That's action. And because Abraham knew God's promises were real. God had promised that through Abraham's seed, the covenant would continue. Isaac was his seed. And so even though God said, go and offer Isaac, God had to have the confidence, sorry, Abraham had to have the confidence that God would raise up Isaac in some way, didn't understand, but he walked in faith. Those are the works that Abraham showed. Um, where do we get to? Verse 22. See, yeah, in verse 23. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. 
So because Abraham was willing to do what he didn't understand, even though it was the guidance of God, even though Abraham was willing to follow and obey, not holding on to his own strength, not holding on to his own beliefs, but believing in God, he was able to be justified. And as the story goes, he didn't have to offer Isaac up as a sacrifice because God provided another sacrifice for him, a ram. And the angel of the Lord had to intervene because Abraham was going to go through with it, believing the miracle that could have happened. Now, me being a parent, being told to take your child and offer them up, man, I couldn't even, I couldn't even imagine how hard that must have been for Abraham. Let's go to Galatians chapter 3. But he followed he didn't stagger at the promise. Galatians chapter 3, in verse 6. And in Galatians chapter 3, uh, just one verse 6, again reiterating, Paul writing, and he said, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And so as we read here, I mean, that's very simple, right? Abraham believed God, and that was counted as righteousness. But as we've looked through the story, and there's a lot more depth we could go into, Abraham believed God. He followed. He showed action. He showed faith. He showed belief in God, not belief in his own strength. He didn't understand what the whole plan was. He couldn't see the end from the beginning like God. He was just willing to follow what God said, trusting and believing Whatever God said is true and was going to be perfect. Now, that's amazing. And by doing those things, he was called the friend of God. So there's a lot of action that Abraham put in to be called the friend of God. Let's finish off in Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. In verse 5. And so now we get to us today, right? In Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. Now we get to us today, and it says here in verse 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, right? by the cleansing, by the new birth. Let, let me read the Amplified. Amplified said he saved us, not because of any works of righteousness that we had done. Any, could any of us, have any of us done anything that's worth being promoted to the kingdom of heaven before we receive the Holy Spirit? <laughs> no. I know for me and not anyways. Anyway, But anyways, so not that we had done, and continuing on he says, but because of his own pity and mercy, by the cleansing bath of the new birth, being born again, regeneration, renewing, the receiving of the Holy Spirit. That is our righteousness today. So we don't have to, like Abraham, travel through the desert, follow along and blindly follow. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Ghost today. We've been baptized in water by full immersion. We've repented of our sins, realizing like the direction and the path that I was on before I got filled with God's Holy Spirit, before he called me, I would have surely been dead by now because I was certainly an adrenaline junkie. Uh, a drug, alcohol, and adrenaline junkie is what led my life. And I'm sure I wouldn't have made it this far, but it's by the grace of God. He's given me that strength to not desire the drugs or the alcohol anymore. The adrenaline, well, he's still working with me on that. But the idea is Abraham believed God, and it was by his faith and works that it was accounted to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. It's by being born again today. We have that righteousness, and we are called the children of God. How amazing is that? That is just so powerful. Praise the Lord. I want to leave it there. And all the people said, amen. All right.